Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about a pretty advanced topic, which odds are going into engineering, you may or may not ever actually need to know this, but it's something that's kind of good to be aware that it's out there, even if it's not something you really use on a daily basis. So we're going to talk about the quaternions, and sometimes you'll also see these called the Hamiltonians named after the guy who invented them, but uh, most people call them the quaternions. So going back, the numbers we kind of started life with, well, we had natural numbers and integers and whatever, but at least we're really comfortable with real numbers. And as far as that goes, right now doing calculus, these are the only numbers we're talking about in this class is real numbers, and they're all on a line. All right. Okay. Well, uh, in algebra, we told you a little bit about complex numbers, which are on a plane. And it was kind of weird because, well, you had a, a real part and then an imaginary part, and you couldn't write a complex number as a single, th I mean, there was a real part and an imaginary part, and you couldn't combine those together at all. Okay, imaginary. No, it is, I don't know, anyway, however you spell imaginary. The point is, there's kind of like an oil and water thing. There's there's two parts to these complex numbers and they don't go together at all in terms of being able to combine them. It's like, there's this real thing, there's this imaginary thing, we gotta keep them separate, but somehow, if you put them together, you get this whole number system. And it has a big advantage, it actually has several big advantages over the real numbers. The first one is that it's so-called algebraically closed. which is just a fancy way of saying, if I take any polynomial, well, let me, let me use Z, because most people use Z for, for uh, complex numbers, and say it equals zero, so this is any polynomial, this always has a solution. Whereas for the real numbers, if I have an equation like x squared plus one is zero, well, there's no real number that satisfies that equation. And so, from an algebra standpoint, the complex numbers are, are much easier to work with because you can always solve polynomial equations. And, I mean, this is definitely beyond the scope of this course, but if you go on to uh, take a class called complex analysis, which is just a fancy way to say this is calculus for complex numbers. Well, things that were not true for real numbers wind up being true. For example, uh, for real numbers, we could have a, fun have a function that has a derivative, but the derivative is not continuous. Right. I mean, the function is continuous. It has a derivative, but the derivative is not continuous. So there, in particular, you can't do a second derivative, right? In complex analysis, once you get one derivative, then you automatically get two and three and however many you want. It goes on forever. And moreover, in real numbers, we had some functions that, like, for example, e to the minus one over x squared, we saw that this one has infinitely mean derivatives. But if we wrote down its Taylor series back in calculus two, uh, it's all these derivatives at zero are equal to zero. So now we get zero, zero x, zero x squared over two factorial zero x cubed over three factorial, those are definitely not equal to each other, right? And then complex analysis, 
once you have even one derivative, you automatically get infinitely many derivatives and you get f is equal to its Taylor series. So anyway, the complex numbers winds up being a, a much more useful place to work in algebra because all the polynomials have solutions. It winds up being a much more easier place to work for calculus because I mean, basically, as soon as you have a derivative, everything you want to do in calculus works. You don't have to worry about any of these pathologies that you have for real numbers. So, but anyway, that's kind of all on the side. The point was the complex numbers are weird because you have these two parts that there's nothing you can do to put them together, right? Okay. So that's just all kind of quick recap. The quaternions also have two parts, but the, the second part is quite a bit more complicated. So a quaternion looks like a number, so a real number, which is still called the real part. And then we have a vector. And this is a vector in R3. So if you count the individual components of the vector all together there's, there's one and then three so this is a four-dimensional thing and we already talked about two ways to multiply vectors we had the dot product and the cross product and they both had some weird algebra things with it I mean for one the dot product of two vectors was not a vector it was a number which that was kind of weird and the cross product, well, the cross product of two vectors is a vector, which is good. But the big thing is this is non-associative. And associativity is kind of what makes all of algebra work. I mean, we don't really even think about how often we use associativity. If you ask, hey, why is 3 times 5x? equal to 15x. Well, most people would just say, oh, that's the way it is, right? Well, no, really you're using associativity there. You're saying three times five x is really three times five x, which is 15 x. So we use the associative property constantly without even thinking about it. So having this vector product that's not associative is really awkward from an algebra standpoint. But the quaternions, so let me show you the multiplication rule. So if I take number plus first vector and then times, I don't know, I'll call it a circle. I don't know what to call it. There's not really a standard uh, symbol for most of the time. Uh, you wind up calling these Q, and then you just say, oh, Q1, Q2. You don't write anything in the middle, right? Because if you don't write anything in the middle, that means multiply. So uh, to multiply two quaternions, you go X0 top. So multiply the real things and subtract the dot product of the vectors. So this is the real part of the answer. And then for the vector part, well, the first part is kind of, if you think about doing full, it's kind of self-explanatory. You should go X naught times Y. And same thing, X naught, or the X vector times Y naught, so Y naught X. And then the last thing is the cross product, or the vector product here. Okay. So that is how to multiply. Quaternions. And the, imagine, uh, the magical thing about this is that this product is associative. So somehow, even though this cross product by itself was not associative, when you kind of throw in these extra terms, you get something associative. And I'm not gonna check this. I mean, you could multiply three together, so I mean you would need to do 
x and then y dot plus y. Multiply those together and then times z naught plus z. And you would have to check, is that equal to, if I go x naught plus x, and then all times y naught plus y, z naught plus z. You can imagine actually multiplying that out would be a pain in the arse. And it is. Uh, and I'm not going to check it because, well, if you go on in algebra, it winds up, uh, all you have to do is check the basis, guys. If you just check those four. So I have, well, I need to pick three of them. So I've got four choices, four choices, four choices. So that's 64 equations is all I actually have to check. And that's still a lot. Well, if one of them's one, it's pretty obviously true. So that cuts me down to 27 equations. And then, well, you know there was that symmetry in the cross product. Like, if I take any of them, if I go I, J, K, and swap them, change them to like J, K, I, or change them to K, I, J, There's a symmetry there, so it winds up, if I, if I check one of these, then the other two I get for free. So basically I can, all uh, out of these 27 equations where these are just i, j, and k, various rearrangements of them, I can actually take this first one to always be i. So that cuts me down to nine equations. So if you wanted to check this in real life rather than having to multiply out both sides, you can just check nine equations where the first one's i, and then these two have to be either i, j, or k. And then, so that's three options for that one, three options for that one. So that gives you nine equations to check. And I mean, they're pretty easy. But anyways, the amazing thing, this is associative. So uh, that's pretty cool. What's even more amazing of the, that it's associative, is that it's actually uh, something called a division ring. Namely, you can divide by these guys. So, which sounds completely screwball. I mean, there's no way, like in a cross product, if I have something like x times y equals x cross z, well, there's, I mean, we learned that this definitely does not mean that y equals z, right? Same thing with the dot product. So I can't just divide both sides by x like I would back in algebra. But it winds up when you, the reason that you can't do that is because it's only part of this quaternionic product. I mean, if you actually look at the full-on quaternions, you do have uh, if q1, q2 equals q1, q3, then q2 equals q3, because I can divide both sides by q1. Uh, and as far as how do you divide, it's actually really easy. If I double check, let's actually do this. So, if I think back to what I learned about complex numbers, well, I had this complex conjugate, a plus bi, the conjugate was a minus bi. And we saw if you multiply these together, you get a squared plus b squared, right? The same thing happens with these quaternions. If I go, whoops, this is not a vector. If I go number plus vector, and then number minus that same vector. Well, if I go back to my rule, I multiply the numbers, so x naught squared, and then I have minus the dot product. Well, there's a minus here, so minus minus, so I'll make it plus x dot itself, which is the norm of x squared. And then what we're gonna see is all this is gonna be zero because I have x naught times minus x. Then I have x naught times plus x. So those two cancel. And then my last thing is minus 
x cross itself, and we learned the cross product of any vectors with itself is zero. So this, the vector part, when I multiply these, all goes away, just like with complex numbers. When I multiply a complex number times its conjugate, there was nothing imaginary in the answer. I just got a real number. Same thing when I multiply a quaternion times its conjugate, I just get a real number here. And so just like for complex numbers, if I want to divide by a plus bi, well, what I do is I rewrite that as the conjugate over this a squared plus b squared. I know how I divide by this because it's real. I can do the same thing for these guys. If I want to divide by a quaternion, I can multiply by the conjugate over its length. So, so actually this, these quaternions, so which I told you they were screwball, they're written with the letter H for Hamiltonian. But again, most people actually call them the quaternions. The reason they picked H and not Q is because Q is already the symbol for the rational numbers. So it was out, so they have to call it H. But anyway, it's uh, something amazing, which is a division ring. So this is, from an algebra standpoint, this is just like the complex numbers, except it's not commutative because of that cross product term. So if I multiply, I don't get the same thing both ways. But otherwise, this this uh, this algebra that has four pieces instead of one or two, it's just as good for algebra as the complex numbers are, which it's kind of amazing that this this even exists. But uh, anyway, so there you go, and it winds up if you go past. Uh, so you might say, well, I know about, for example, now I know r, I know r squared, I know r4. Well, could I keep finding these if I keep going? Well, it winds up, you can almost find one at r8. At r8, you can still divide, which was the most spectacular thing, but it's at the expense of being non-associative. And so the... The practical applications, because it's non-associative, are very restricted. But the fact that you can divide, I mean, that is something to keep in mind. So, uh, I mean, it still makes it pretty special. So these are called the, the Cayley numbers, or they're called, well, in a, Amazing creativity, the octonians. So, uh, so there is this one more that works, but it's losing the associativity is really bad. So, uh, that's and that's it. These are all the all the number systems you can make where division is possible. And I'll record one more video about these, kind of describing geometrically what's interesting about these Hamiltonians, but, or quaternions, but anyway, this is just how they work. <laughs>